So I've got eight hard rock and heavy metal bootlegs to go through this time, including a compilation of live recordings from bands, as well as a non-music bootleg, and I'll go into depth a little bit more on that. So stay tuned for record details, needle drops, sound ratings, and all of that. Let's do it. First up is Iron Maiden with Christmas 80. This came out through Metal Mania Records out of Japan, obviously. Uh, the show was December 21st, 1980, uh, in support of their debut album. That date might also sound familiar to Maiden fans, as it was released as a home video as well, called Live at the Rainbow. The difference, of course, is that there are only seven tracks on that home video. This is actually the entire show. Well, kind of the entire show. There were four tracks during that show that were poorly recorded, uh, bad cables or something like that. So Maiden had to re-perform those four tracks. The re-performers are on here, not the mistake tracks. Um, they are side four of this record right here. Um, during the track Drifter, you can hear Paul Diano mention about them having to do it again. So that's what that's in reference to. Pretty fun. The cool thing about this show is they actually performed six tracks from what would be their upcoming album, Killers. So folks at this show got to hear those tracks a bit early, which is awesome. I love that with bootlegs or just concerts in general when they play upcoming songs. Uh, one interesting thing about the title track to Killers on this is that it does have different lyrics. And the story goes that uh, Paul hadn't finished the lyrics to it, so he made up the lyrics five minutes before the show. Now, is that true? Is that not true? I'm not sure, but that's basically the story going around. Even though it's kind of fun to hear it with alternate lyrics because you're so used to the you know the studio version. One thing that's really cool about this bootleg and about bootlegs in general, the good ones at least, is that you get to hear the audience and I love hearing that. They don't drown out the band, you hear them perfectly in the mix, love that. Also cool pictures in the gatefold. Uh, you're getting more gatefolds of bootlegs this time which is really interesting. Uh, I see more of this. People are putting more effort into bootlegs and the presentation in general. So, very cool. I love this era of Iron Maiden. Definitely. In addition to the audience, you also get to hear a lot of in-between song banter from Paul Diano. I love that. Um, he does curse quite a bit, which is also kind of fun. You know. As for tracks, let's hear one of those now. This is Prowler. Vinyl on this one is 2LP Gray Splatter. Uh, what's interesting about this is that there was a black pressing and a clear pressing, uh, one after the other. And what happened was they didn't clean out the whatever it is they clean out when they, when they press these. And so some of the black got in with some of the clear, and you get this opaque gray splatter. Interesting mistake variant, I guess you could call it. So the sound on this is pretty decent, although it's not live album quality. Um, it's a little tinny at times. The drums are a little bit in the back, but everyone else is good in the mix, especially the bass. We all love hearing Steve Harris, so there's that. Uh, the performance is stellar. Paul Diano's belting out those vocals. Of course, I, again, I love this era of the band. I love hearing Diano's voice. Just incredible. So I love live recordings from this era. I especially love them because the only thing we got commercially back then was the Made in Japan EP. And that's only, what, four or five songs, depending on where you got it. This is a double album, and I would love to have seen this back then. I don't think EMI or Harvest really wanted to invest that much money in Iron Maiden, at least the Diano era Maiden. So we got an EP, that's okay, but I love these double record bootlegs from this era because you, you get all the great songs you want to hear from this early era. So... Pretty cool. Uh, this is an audience recording. It is not a soundboard recording, but it's a pretty good audience recording. So overall, pretty stellar. This is Iron Maiden with Christmas 80. Next up is Slayer with Monsters of Rock 1994. This is recorded at Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, obviously the South American leg of the Monsters of Rock tour. Uh, the headlining acts were Kiss, Black Sabbath, and Suicidal Tendencies. 
Uh, this was released by Fallen Angel Records. Uh, they haven't done a lot of boots. They did a couple Slayer boots, they did a couple Black Sabbath boots, and not much else. But pretty cool bootleg. So this show starts off with Hell Awaits, of course. Um, interesting thing is that this is for the Divine Intervention Tour, and there's only one song from that record in this set list, uh, such being Mind Control. That's kind of interesting. Uh, the set list is actually heavier with Seasons in the Abyss tracks. There are four songs on that album, which is kind of curious. Um, also, I really love the live version of Mandatory Suicide. I always have, because Tom Araya decides to, instead of doing the talk part as a talk part at the end, he just yells and screams it out live. And I think that's even better. They should have done that on the record. It would have been much cooler. I should mention that there's a little bit of messy guitar playing in some tracks, not a lot, but some. Uh, Jesus Save seems to have it particularly bad. I don't know if they're drunk or whatever, but there's some sloppy playing there, for sure. Uh, not too bad, though, I should say. Um, one thing I love about uh, South of Heaven, uh, this version, but like every version, even back to the studio recording of it, is that Tom Araya, still, even in 1994, is pronouncing the word deity as deity. I love that. Has no one told him that's the wrong way to say it? I don't know. But I just think that's really funny. Uh, the album ends with Angel of Death. Of course, it should end with Angel of Death. Classic track. Great show ender. Also, no crowd audio on this one. Um, it sounds more like a bootleg version of a live in studio recording, though it does lean more towards bootleg quality than live album quality. It's a little disheartening, I think, for all of us who have heard a lot of quarantine shows, um, you know, that also live in studio with no audience whatsoever. Kind of missing that audience a bit. I know I am. Maybe you are as well. So when I hear it on a bootleg, I'm also like, where's the audience? I want to hear it. This is the entire show, though Die by the Sword, for some reason, was moved late in the bootleg. Uh, it should be a lot earlier in the set list. But other than that, this is the entire show from the Monsters of Rock in Buenos Aires. So let's check out the only song from Haunting the Chapel here. This is Captor of Sin. Final for this one is 2LP Classic Black. Track listings on the B side. Uh, also comes in a gatefold. Uh, picture band, a little bit of a write up there. Um, it's a pretty decent bootleg. Um, if I'm being picky about it, um, the drums are a little high in the mix. Uh, the bass is very low. It does sound a smidge flat, and there are some audio drop downs a little bit, not too bad. Um, Tom Rai's vocals are high at the beginning, but then they level out by track two. It's, it's pretty listenable overall, though. Those are really just picky things I'm talking about there. But yeah, this is Slayer with Monsters of Rock, 1994. Next up is Judas Priest with Metalizer. This was released by Cult Legend Recordings, which is a pretty big bootleg company. They've put out boots for Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath and Metallica and a whole lot of other metal bands. You should definitely check into Cult Legend Recordings if you're into bootlegs, for sure. Uh, this was recorded on February 24th, 2015 at the Enmore Theatre in Sydney, Australia. Of course, that does mean that this is Richie and Glenn on guitars. I would say that short of having the mighty K.K. Downing back in this band, and I still hope for that, I'll be honest, I do love Richie and Glenn together. Of course, this is also Glenn in better times, given what we know now. Uh, much respect for Glenn. He is a metal god in his own right, and yeah, um, this is him in better times, and we are really lucky to have him still, I'll be honest. So four tracks from Redeemer of Souls. That is the album that this tour is in support of. We've got Dragon Knot, uh, Halls of Valhalla, March of the Damned, and Redeemer of Souls. I do love that Devil's Child and Jawbreaker on here. I uh, love the deep cuts when Jewish Priest does that. A lot of legacy bands should do more of that. I remember Dio did it quite often when he was playing. Pretty cool. And it does end with Defenders of the Faith of all tracks. Amazing. Um, I didn't find that happening on too many other set lists of other tours, either before or after, so it seems like it's more of a Redeemer Souls tour thing. Very cool. Killer way to end a show. 
And this is the entire show, including the two encores. Uh, what's also cool is you can hear the audience singing along to a lot of the classics, especially the final four or five songs, uh, Breaking the Law, Hellbent for Leather, You've Got Another Thing Coming, and Living After Midnight. Just killer. It's like you're at the show. Amazing. So let's check out a track from my favorite Priest album, Defenders of the Faith. This is Jawbreaker. Vinyl on this one is 2LP Red with Black Marble. There you go. Also comes with a poster. Here, a very cool poster. A live shot of the band. Very nice. And there is a gatefold as well. And bootlegs have come a long way since the 1980s, I gotta tell you. Uh, when I was a kid buying boots, uh, basically what you would get is a white jacket, and then someone would take a piece of squared paper massively over uh, Xerox, stick it on the front uh, with a blown out picture and some text, and nothing on the back, and that was your bootleg. Uh, the record would have even less on it, and there wouldn't be posters and other insert stuff, so you gotta love this era for boots. It's pretty cool. So the sound on this is okay. It's a little muffled, but not prohibitively so. Also, the volume does change slightly from side to side, but that's really being picky. Uh, despite this being called a special tour edition, whatever the hell that means, uh, this is bootleg quality, and it's likely an audience recording. Of course, there is a commercial live album for the Redeemer Souls Tour, such being the 2016 release of Battle Cry. Also came out on home video. Um, if you prefer that, you could go to that. Um, there is slightly different track listings on that and this, but I'm a Priest fan. I'm going to buy both. You might be as well. So there it is. Anyways, this is Judas Priest with Metalizer. Next up is Motorhead with Tales of Glory. This is released by Magic Dice Records, who've done a handful of classic rock bootlegs. Uh, Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, ACDC, Jethro Tull, and Motorhead, apparently. Uh, this is recorded live at L'Amour in Queens, New York City, on August 10th, 1983, which means this is in support of their Another Perfect Day album, which also means that Fast Eddie Clark should not be on this cover because he left the band before that album. He was replaced with Brian Robertson here, um, ex-Thin Lizzy, who brought a rather slightly different sound to that album. Some people don't like Another Perfect Day because of the slight sound change. I happen to kind of dig it. You can hear moments of Thin Lizzy on that record which is pretty interesting. You hear it here as well. So, not too bad. I like the album, so I definitely picked up this boot. Uh, the uh, listing, the track listing rather, is very heavy with tracks from that album. In fact, every song is from Another Perfect Day, except for Iron Horse Born to Lose, which of course is on the first album. I should also mention that after the live songs, there is an interview with Lemmy Kilmister. It takes up the second half of the entire second side of the record. Uh, pretty cool. Lemmy is funny and insightful and has a lot to say about a lot of things. Very cool. Uh, in talking, they do mention that the FM broadcast this show is from aired on the King Biscuit Flower Hour, which is a syndicated radio program back at least in the 80s. It might go back farther. Um, in the United States, maybe also Canada. I'm not sure. Canadians, let me know if you've heard that show before. I love the King Biscuit Flower Hour, despite its goofy name. Uh, it was one of the two main sources for me to hear hard rock and heavy metal on the radio in the 1980s. The other, of course, being Metal Shop. What an amazing show that was. So it was cool to know that this was broadcast on there. Pretty cool. Also, just as an aside, I was looking at these uh, these tour posters here that Motorhead played with Wendy O, S.O.D., and the Chromags. I would have killed to see that show back then. Amazing. Amazing. So let's hear one of the singles from this tour's album. This is Shine. Shine. 
Vinyl variant here is Classic Black, uh, one LP Classic Black, limited to 500 copies. Sound on this is bootleg good, I would call it. Uh, there is some feedback occasionally. Uh, of course, it's Motorhead, so you're going to get that. Everyone's up in the mix, though, including Lemmy's bass, which I can appreciate. So overall, yeah, it's listenable. And yeah, I know, Another Perfect Day is pretty much a dark horse in Motorhead's catalog, but I'm pretty good with it, and I wanted a bootleg from that era. Now, would I prefer bootlegs from the era between Overkill and Iron Fist? Yeah, I probably would. But I wanted one boot at least from this tour, and I got that, and I'm happy with it. Anyways, this is Motorhead with Tales of Glory. Next up is a compilation of live performances. This is Nawabum at the BBC. It was released by a company called Made of Fail. Uh, they do a lot of bootlegs for BBC recordings. Um, bootlegs are unofficial releases. I'm not sure if they have any sort of relationship with the BBC. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. My research didn't lead me either direction, so there's that. Should talk about the Friday Rock Show. Uh, that's the source for all of these recordings. The Friday Rock Show was a syndicated radio program in the UK, hosted by Tommy Vance. Uh, they took a lot of chances with showcasing up-and-coming hard rock and heavy metal bands in the UK. Uh, there might have been other genres, but for the purposes of our discussion here, it's hard rock and heavy metal. I mean, I can't imagine who else was playing bands such as Trespass and Praying Mantis and Angel Witch, Tigers of Pantang back in 1979 and 1980 other than the Friday Rock Show. So big props to them. So of the band sets on this album, the ones I was most impressed with were the Def Leppard set, the Saxon set, and the Angel Witch set, especially Saxon. They are tight and rockin'. Totally great set. Also very weird artwork going on here. There is a gatefold. Uh, with all of the bands that play on it. There's also a volume two to this series, which I want to get. It looks pretty killer. I see Raven and Girl School and Vardis and a whole bunch of other bands on here. Gotta get it. Um, also, I should probably show you the cover again because I want to talk about this font. Uh, it would suggest that Iron Maiden's on this comp and on the next one. They are on neither, just so you know. So let's check out an earlier version of a classic Angel Witch song. This is the track, Angel Witch. Vinyl variant for this one is 2LP Classic Black with very nice custom labels. Again, bootlegs. Go figure. Uh, the sound on this is pretty decent. Uh, I would say it's pretty damn decent. Um, this is meant for radio after all, and it is the BBC, so why would it suck? Uh, very well mixed, well performed, everyone throughout. So anyways, this is Nawabum at the BBC. Next up is Guns N' Roses with Welcome to a Night at the Ritz. This was put out by Coda Publishing. Uh, Coda Publishing is also a UK label, but they specialize in unofficial releases, mostly of a live nature. They also have a really extensive catalog of live albums. So you should definitely check them out if you're looking for that, for sure. Show date for this one is February 2nd, 1988 at the Ritz in New York City. And if that sounds very familiar to some of you, it should. Uh, this is also the show that MTV recorded and aired live. Um, live at the Ritz was a series that MTV actually did uh, where they showcased different bands live. Guns N' Roses was one of them. And that's what this recording is. So I'm a little bit familiar with the show. I had saw it back in 1988. I taped it. I've heard it a bunch of times. I almost forgot that Axel self-censors himself lyrically quite a bit, probably because it's for MTV. But then he decides to not do that in some tracks, and he just lets loose with the cursing, which I love. Um, also interesting is that you can hear Duff McKagan's backing vocals on this quite a bit. Um, you don't hear them as well on studio recordings, but it's pretty front and center here. Um, his voice is all right. He's a better bass player. In fact, a pretty amazing bass player, as we all know. Also, I'm really digging the live intro to My Michelle on this. Uh, it's, a, it's an exclusive live intro. I love when bands do special live intros to songs. Very cool. 
I should mention that there are two tracks missing from this performance. Uh, Night Train isn't here, as well as their cover of Aerosmith's Mama Kin. Uh, Coda did release a 2LP 10-inch record limited edition version of this uh, in 2020 that has those two tracks. So if you're desperately wanting them, they're available that way. But I'd rather have a 12-inch record. I like them more than 10 inches, so I'm okay with this. So, let's hear one of my fave tracks on Appetite. This is It's So Easy. A vinyl variant for this one is 1LP white marbled vinyl, what the cover is calling skull-colored vinyl. Sure. This is likely the second pressing, limited to 3,000 copies. The sound on this is okay. Um, it's decent bootleg quality. I thought it would be better because, you know, MTV. Uh, guitars and vocals are rather high in the mix. There's that. Also, I forgot how loose the playing is. Uh, it's messy at times. And Axel sings however he's going to sing live, you know, which is, he's okay. He's better in studio. Um, but yeah, it's Guns N' Roses, you know what to expect. I actually did see them later in 1988 on tour uh, at the Orpheum in Boston. I believe Zodiac Mind Warp and UDO were the opening acts, which is pretty interesting. And they were messy then too, so it's par for course with this band. So this is Welcome to a Night at the Ritz, also known as Welcome to Paradise City. It has two names, by Guns N' Roses. Next up is Van Halen with Zero Demos. This is the original 1976 demos recorded by the band. Uh, these demos have been bootlegged to death over the decades. There have been lots and lots of bootleg companies that have put this out. This is Yellow Dog's version of it. Uh, Yellow Dog is a fairly known bootleg company, and my experience with them has been generally favorable. A lot of what they've put out has been fairly decent sounding. Uh, this is also fairly decent sounding. I'll get into the sound quality later, but spoiler alert, it's really good. So this recording is 10 of the known 24 tracks recorded and produced and all of that by Gene Simmons of KISS, of course. Um, sometimes the number is as high as 29 tracks, though 24 are more or less known. What's really funny about this is that Gene Simmons seemed to be the only person in KISS, or even around KISS, that thought that Van Halen really had the stuff to make it. In fact, KISS management was quoted as saying that they had no chance of making it whatsoever which is hilarious. Gene clearly knew something that the rest of them did not. So, let's check out an early version of the track, House of Pain. Vinyl for this one is 1LP white with red and blue splatter. How patriotic. Uh, the sound on this is amazing, as I said. Top-notch mixing, recording. You even get some of that Van Halen classic backing vocal sound. Um, I know they did some overdubs. It might have been at the record plant in LA. I can't remember, but there was definitely some sweetening of these demo tracks. Um, I also love hearing some early versions of otherwise classic Van Halen songs, as well as some non-LP songs I've never heard before. The quality of this is amazing, and I feel like this could be another Van Halen album. I could listen to this along with other classic albums. It's that good. So anyways, this is Van Halen with zero demos. So one type of bootleg that a lot of people don't know even exists is the interview bootleg. Um, some of the sources for these interviews are, include uh, media sources like TV shows and things like that. But also some of them come straight from the interviewer's cassette tape. Uh, this is the latter type, uh, probably my favorite kind of interview because it's very, it's very candid, it's very unedited. I like that quite a bit. Uh, by the way, this is Kiss with Framed. Um, it was released by Tayback Marketing back in 1990. Uh, they are a company out of London. They do a lot of interview discs, uh, both in picture disc and vinyl formats. Uh, if you're looking for that, that's what they got. Uh, they do pop metal bands. Uh, they do metal bands. They do all sorts of bands. You should definitely check them out. 
So judging by what's being said on this interview as being new, I can easily say that this was recorded in 1985, regardless of the 1982 image going on in this cover. Obviously, bootlegs. They get pictures wrong. Uh, it's a pretty cool interview. It's also in a restaurant. You can hear the waitress interrupting and the clinking of plates and glasses. I kind of like that. It gives it a sort of verite quality. It's like you're sitting there next to Gene listening to him go on and on about all sorts of things. Uh, some of the things they do discuss are the uh, the KISS lineup changes and how that affected their audiences, how it changed their audiences, really. Also, the validity of heavy metals in there. Gene talks about music from the Elder a little bit, uh, bringing in Bruce Kulick, all sorts of topics. Pretty cool stuff. I also can't get it out of my head that the female interviewer sounds exactly like the woman who's interviewing Spinal Tap towards the end of the movie. The voice is uncannily like hers. Um, of course, I've seen that movie a zillion times, so maybe that has something to do with it. But yeah, just can't get that out of my head when I hear this. And of course, here's a sample from the interview. There's nothing to rebel against. So the only thing I can go back to is that line that Marlon Brando said in uh, The Wild Ones. He's in a soda store and his friends are ripping up the town and this girl comes up and she says, what are you rebelling against? And he says, what do you got? Great line. And I think it defines something that metal, if that's the genre we're talking about, I consider it rock, as opposed to rock and roll. But metal is rebellion for rebellion's sake, period, which I think is good. It cleanses the soul, and sometimes it's like primal therapy. When you get into a room and the doctor says, okay, now I want you to scream your guts out as loud as you can, and I won't tell you to stop. And you go, and it's good. Boy, it feels great. It's like football games. You don't care who wins. If the winner, you know, gets a goal or whatever, you scream your head off. And if the, uh, you know, the opposite team does something that you hate, you'll boo. And, you know, it's good. And that, that's, that metal is very, very important for music. I don't think that music is supposed to necessarily soothe the savage breast and lull you into this numbness. I think music should stir you up. Vinyl for my copy is one LP red. It also came out in purple as well as green, which would also suggest that there's a blue one out there somewhere, but my research didn't lead me to that color. So there might only be three, who knows. Anyways, the sound quality is okay, um, but it's an interview disc. It doesn't need to be amazing. Um, there are some uh, pops and some surface noise in it, especially towards the beginning of each side. But again, who cares? It's an interview. You'll be fine. So anyways, this is Kiss with Framed. And that's it for recent bootleg finds. Of course, some of you have bootlegs out there too. You should tell me which ones you've got, which ones you really love hearing over and over again. I definitely love my bootlegs. Also, let me know some of your sources. I know there are a lot of websites out there. A lot of the bootleg companies have websites out there, so they're selling them. eBay sells them on occasion as well. And uh, record stores. Sometimes you run into them at record stores, though. Not a lot of record stores, let's be honest. Anyways, let me know that and anything else that makes sense in the comments below. Of course, if you dug this video, definitely give it one of these. Also, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And share this video with some of your friends. This is the Accusation Network. My name is Matt, and each week I do videos on metal vinyl collecting. Occasionally, I also do videos on classic and modern metal in general. If you like that, check out my playlist. I do over a dozen shows in and around these subjects. I think you'll dig it. Why not, right? Also on YouTube, you should definitely check out Heavy Metallurgy, great channel with Marty and Alan. They do some great stuff. You should already be subscribed to them. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.